The oceans cover seven-tenths of the world's surface and in places reach a depth of six miles, a huge world of water over and through which moves every kind of creature and thing. Some of the things are the Navy's own and some belong to foreign powers. Finding out whose they are, where they are, and where they are going is the job of the Navy's ocean systems technician. Everything that moves on or under the sea creates its own sound patterns which reveal a great deal about its size, speed, and location. Traveling great distances underwater, these distinctive sounds can be intercepted by listening to vital monitoring stations for recording, analysis, and processing. Here, ocean systems technicians maintain a vigilant around-the-clock surveillance of the sounds recorded in their area. The ocean systems technician's job is to recognize the difference between the various recorded sound patterns, for example, between that of the undisturbed ocean and the sound signatures made by all types of vessels. He selects significant features for analysis, recording vast amounts of data in computer language so that it can be further reduced, analyzed, and plotted. Is it a friend or foe? Where is it? Where is it going? Important information is then relayed to a command center for further action. While one branch of the ocean systems technician rating performs this vital kind of electronic sentry duty, men in a second branch of the rating are responsible for maintaining and repairing the complex equipment used by the first group. Constant vigilance requires the constant maintenance testing, adjustment, and repair of highly sensitive instruments whose accuracy and dependability must never falter. Ocean systems technicians usually work at isolated shore stations and only rarely aboard ships. It's a demanding, sometimes repetitive indoor job requiring long watches. While it is not the glamorous kind of oceanography featured on television, the ocean systems technician's work does call for a special kind of man or woman. To qualify for this rating, you must have normal hearing and color perception, 20-20 correctable vision, high intelligence, and must qualify for a secret security clearance. A recruit must first complete training at the ocean systems technician school. He will learn basic mathematics the physical properties of water and its effect on sound propagation and transmission. On-the-job training will include how to operate and maintain power supplies, tape recorders and special electronic equipment. The student will learn all the tools of his trade from power and hand tools to electronics test equipment and electrical measuring instruments. Basic knowledge useful in many civilian occupations such as electronic repair and data processing. Ocean Systems Technician is a new rating, with less than 1% of the Navy's enlisted men and women involved. The Ocean Systems Technician is a sentry on the nation's front line of vigilance, where months of training and seemingly endless hours of watching culminate in moments of critical activity, when the nation's very security may seem to be at stake. When these times come, no job in the Navy is more important than that of the Ocean Systems Technician. perfect cloak for the stealth of the enemy. Within its dark depths, throughout its vast expanse, the enemy can hide. And even as he hides, can approach our shores. In two world wars, submarines took thousands of lives. 
and so harassed our shipping that they very nearly choked off the flow of materiel needed for victory. After World War II, rapid progress in developing new types of submarines made it clear that the enemy would soon be able to threaten us with complete destruction. A submarine using nuclear fuel would be able to cruise almost indefinitely beneath the surface. And it could be foreseen that, thus cloaked by the sea, the submarine would be a mobile launching pad for missiles with atomic warheads. At relatively short range, it could direct a total carnage on our cities and production centers. This specter of annihilation, fast becoming starkly real, was perhaps the most ominous of all the threats to the nation's safety. The nation's leaders responsible for that safety acted. In the year 1950, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a group of leading American scientists from naval, industrial, and university establishments were brought together and handed a vital part of the problem. This was to investigate the most effective means of detecting enemy submarines. Reviewing all the pertinent facts, these men found promise in several areas. One was the wartime discovery used to enable airmen downed in the ocean to signal their plight, that low frequency sounds travel through water for long distances. When a ditched airman detonated an explosive signal in the water, the resulting underwater explosion created sound waves. Sound waves travel through water about five times faster than through the air, and much farther. Like all sound waves, as they spread out from their source, they weaken. But it was discovered that low frequency waves could still be detected hundreds of miles away by underwater listening devices called hydrophones. A second lead was the discovery that submarines radiated strong, low-frequency sounds. This, coupled with the knowledge that such sounds traveled long distances, was highly significant. For the Hartwell Group, it provided the basis for an optimistic report. A system for detecting submarine low-frequency sounds at long range, they concluded, might well be feasible. Bell Telephone Laboratories was authorized to undertake development of such a system. These laboratories had already carried out important underwater sound research. Also highly pertinent was the fact that they had invented the sound spectrograph, a research device which sorted the various frequencies of sound and displayed them visually. This research tool was now successfully modified to analyze and display low-frequency underwater sounds. To pick up these sounds, unique underwater equipment had to be devised. It included highly sensitive hydrophones, which could be put down a mile or more deep in the ocean and left there to operate trouble-free indefinitely. Sea cables of great complexity and extraordinary strength were required. To design such a cable, experimental models were subjected to the most exacting physical and electrical tests. Electronic devices to determine the direction of the sound signals were developed. All the work was correlated with an intensive study of the behavior of sound in ocean water. The Navy, the laboratories, and Western Electric worked closely throughout the project. So well did the experimental work progress that within a year, a prototype submarine detection system had been designed and built off the Bahama Islands. The prototype station was located on the island of Eleuthera. The tests carried out at this experimental station showed that the proposed method was practical. Here is how it works. An array of hydrophones carefully positioned on the ocean floor receives underwater sounds. The hydrophones convert the sound impulses to electrical signals and transmit them through a cable to the shore station where they are analyzed. 
The signal is complex, containing many frequencies. As the signal passes through the analyzer, the frequencies are sorted out and displayed on a continuously moving strip of electrosensitive paper. We can see how the display is created by observing a display console in operation. The signal causes the moving stylus to burn a trace. This technique is called LOFAR, short for Low Frequency Analyzing and Recording. To the initiated, these dark lines are significant. After a year of testing at the Eleuthera Experimental Station, the basic design for a land-based, long-range, underwater listening system had been achieved. Could the principles proved at Eleuthera be used to create an effective oceanic system for detecting underwater threats? To find out, the Navy authorized Western Electric to engineer, manufacture, and install a nine-station system designed by Bell Laboratories. When this system proved workable, additional stations were installed on the East Coast and on the West Coast. The building of each station began at the edge of the sea. Reconnaissance teams surveyed possible shore station sites along remote and desolate stretches of shore. Frogmen explored the beach approaches to establish the best cable route. Engineers made careful electrical measurements along the proposed cable run to be sure ground currents would not create serious interference. With the shore site chosen, the dark ocean depths had to be compelled to yield their secrets. A hydrographic survey ship began the search for the best place at sea to put down the hydrophone array. Since this would be a pinpointing operation, bases for precision navigational aid such as LORAC had to be set up ashore, often in wild coastal country which could be reached only by helicopter. This equipment made it possible for the hydrographic ship to know its precise position at all times. Somewhere out there, a hundred miles or so from shore, a place had to be found where the hydrophone array could be put down. Somewhere out beyond the continental shelf, on the slopes where the Earth's crust makes a spectacular descent to the ocean abyss. Below 6,000 feet, the waters are as black as only a sunless world can be. Somewhere in that jagged, descending terrain, a flat area for the 1,800-foot-long array had to be found. Other questions would have to be answered. Will the bottom support the array? Are there acoustic obstructions? Are there deep ocean currents which might dislodge the array? To answer these and many other questions called for a series of checks and tests using oceanographic instruments. A whole complex of hydrographic and oceanographic data were compiled. On the basis of these data, several possible sites for the array were selected. Now the question was, which had the better sound reception? In Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Project Caesar personnel analyzed all the survey findings and prepared a report to the Navy. This report recommended exactly where to place the hydrophone array and the precise cable route to the shore. This route had to be known exactly because differing depths and bottom conditions would require different types of cable armor. The specifications for each cable went to the Simplex Wire and Cable Plant in New Hampshire. This is the largest plant of its kind in the world. 
It was specially equipped by the Navy to produce cable for the Project Caesar installations. The conductors for the cable must conform to the most precise electrical tolerances ever required in a cable design and must give trouble-free electrical performance through the years. The cable must be able to withstand the ocean's buffeting and must be impervious to corrosion, marine boring organisms, and all other physical and electrical hazards the ocean may hold. This is the largest, most complex ocean cable ever made. Yet it meets unprecedented requirements for quality and reliability. After the pairs of heavy conductors have been twisted, they are armored according to the ocean bottom conditions along the cable route. The completed cable is transferred from the plant to the cable ship. The machinery on this ship for both loading and laying had to be especially designed for Project Caesar. With several cable types of different weight and size being taken aboard, the loading plan had to be carefully worked out to assure the stability and trim of the ship throughout the long sea voyage to the laying area and during the lay itself. The bulky, heavy, stiff cable presented considerable handling problems. In some cases, the relatively short, shallow water section of cable was transferred into a landing craft. With its cable aboard, the craft was transported to the offshore location where the section was to be laid. Before beaching operations started, Navy frogmen reconnoitered the landing route through the shallow water zone. In most cases, a trench had to be blasted to protect the cable from surf and tidal action. To help beach the cable, flotation bags were used. The cable was then hauled in by tractor. Frogmen put steel casings around any cable lengths which might still be damaged by surf. Meanwhile, the cable laying ship with the array and the main section of cable aboard headed out to sea. Approaching the sea site, precision navigational aid equipment was used, enabling the ship to reoccupy the precise position indicated by the survey, within plus or minus 50 feet. As the navigational aid fixes were being plotted, the captain followed the ship's track intently. The moment of decision approached. Out there, far below the surface of the sea, down in the deep blackness, among the steep and rugged contours of the descending ocean bottom, was an isolated area of flatness. Within that small flat area, the 1,800-foot array had to be put down on a specified bearing. The ship maneuvered toward one particular pinpoint on the face of the globe, designated Point Love. Here was the job to be done. The array anchor had to be made to bite into the ocean bottom at Point Love and hold under tension as the tug pulled the ship. Array and cable had to be paid out on an exact bearing from the anchor point until the array rested on its prescribed location. Axial cables extending far to seaward have added a new dimension to Project Caesar, our Navy's sound surveillance system. In addition to this new sonar transmission facility, Bell Telephone Laboratories has also modified the shore station analysis equipment with state-of-the-art advances. Advances in beam forming, time compression and data storage, 
analysis and display. This new highly reliable solid state equipment provides improved detection and greater resolution of underwater signals. Signals which can strip away the natural sea camouflage from a submarine and pinpoint its location. The coaxial C terminal of a Caesar station consists of a hydrophone array and carrier equipment. The hydrophones detect minute pressure changes in the water caused by sound waves and convert them into electrical impulses. The carrier multiplex equipment prepares these impulses for transmission through the coaxial cable. Cable repeaters or amplifiers are installed to offset losses in the cable. Thus, with the coaxial cable, signals from an array can be carried to the shore station for analysis and display. In the shore equipment, the signals are amplified, formed into beams, time compressed and stored, analyzed, and displayed. With the introduction of digital spectrum analyzers, performance in each of these areas has been significantly improved over earlier equipment. This improved beam forming device is called a magnetic delay line, or MDL. It is superior to earlier fixed delay networks due to its great flexibility, its increased frequency response, and its smaller size. DSA consists of a deltic, a delay time compressor, and a frequency spectrum analyzer. This is the heart of the shore analysis terminal. Incoming signals to the DSA are first time compressed and temporarily stored in the deltic. Compression and storage provide the time to repeatedly scan and completely frequency analyze the incoming information in the spectrum analyzer. Let's look inside the DSA and see how it works. Each signal frequency is displayed as a vertical line on electrosensitive paper. Random noise is recorded as a diffused gray background. By interpreting the frequency and spacing of these signal lines, it is possible to determine the type of target generating these frequencies. Also, knowing the bearing angle, and by judging the intensity of the lines, it is possible to approximate the general location of the target. Thus, both classification and location information are displayed. In summary then, Caesar stations equipped with magnetic delay lines and digital spectrum analyzers provide more flexible beam forming, greater signal storage, narrower analysis bandwidth, and wider frequency display than previous systems. The result is greater signal resolution and improved detectability. This then is SOSIS, today's Caesar sound surveillance system, meeting the challenge of advances in submarine warfare with up-to-date electronic detection devices. As other Caesar stations are added to SOSIS, more and more of the vast ocean spaces fall under our scrutiny, providing the United States Navy with a most effective underwater detection system. It is I, your captain, the Ocular Duck, and today we're back at the helm of the USS Olympia, a Los Angeles-class nuclear attack submarine here in cold waters. The Soviets have crossed the Iron Curtain and are attacking into West Germany, and it's our mission to get out into the open sea lanes and stop them. So we're here back at Hollylock at our base in western England. 
uh, where our LA class sub is going to get resupplied and re-equipped. And right now we're getting sent out on a mission to stop a group of Spetsnaz commandos who are coming down out of their base and going to attempt to attack uh, a city in uh, what is still NATO control. So as we start to head over to the map, um, I'll start to talk a little bit today about not only the attack that we're going to go through, but some of the technology that's also being displayed here in cold waters. If you like content like this, a little bit of gameplay, a little bit of history and technology, feel free to give us a like and a subscribe. So as we cut over back to the main campaign map, we see these lines that are being drawn um, between Greenland, Iceland, uh, the Faroe Islands, and the UK itself, as well as between Norway and uh, uh, Northern Islands that are also the property of Norway. And somehow every time a Soviet submarine or vessel crosses these lines, uh, we're able to pick them up. So it's not just when our satellites and our long range reconnaissance naval aircraft fly over them, it's also when they cross these lines. So why is this here? Is it just a magic thing that the game put in so you know where stuff is? No, it's in fact the SOSIS net um, which was an underground, uh, underwater set of hydrophones that the United States had deployed between the points represented here on the map. Um, and it was a series of the same passive equipment, at least the same principle, uh, that are on your submarine. They passively listen for sounds in the water. Um, and when ships and submarines cross these lines and come within range uh, of the passive sonar system, they're picked up by the uh, the underwater sound phones and translated to bases on the land that then broadcast them out to your vessel and to the rest of the fleet so you understand what's going on. Uh, so we get into a little bit of the history around SOSIS. Um, it was originally an array that was deployed by the United States early in the Cold War. Um, so as early as 1949, the United States Navy realized that with the Soviet Union so far away and the United States pe uh, possessing a clear superiority uh, in terms of a surface fleet, the biggest risk that the Soviets posed was with its submarines, either infiltrating uh, commando teams into the United States um, or using their submarines, much like uh, the Germans did, to cut off lanes of supply between the United States and its then developing NATO allies. Um, so they put together a plan to lay out a chain of sonar buoys um, or these underwater hydrophones. Uh, first, originally along the coast of the United States, out to the Bahamas, down around Cuba, into the Caribbean, off the coast of Dominica, um, and the Dominican Republic Haiti, which is the island of Hispaniola, um, and down into the Windward and Leeward Islands, down towards South America. This was designed to be a net that any submarine or surface vessel uh, that would come across these or come within range of these passive hydrophones would get picked up. Um, so the research phase kicked off at MIT in the 1950s, um, and by 1952, they started deploying these active arrays out into the North Atlantic Basin, um, and the SOSIS was deployed, just simply called Sound Surveillance System, or in military jargon, SOSIS for short. Um, so it worked pretty well. They actually started tracking, um, originally for practice, Royal Navy and U.S. Navy surface ships, including some of our own uh, submarines that were laying underwater cable um, or passing through the area and we were able to pick them up and track them. So the way that it works is it isn't just one uh, hydrophone that picks it up because of a hydrophone if it's omnidirectional all it can hear uh, is a noise and then it's possible that it can estimate the distance of that noise from the single hydrophone but that doesn't really help then you just know that there's an item uh, within a circle around the hydrophone. You're not exactly sure where when they're omnidirectional, or should I say multidirectional. Um, so they uh, laid these out in a net. Uh, now they necessarily weren't all actually strung together like shown in this photo, um, but what would happen is multiple different uh, hydrophones in the network would pick up a contact, and then you'd be able to triangulate the exact location of that contact based off of those multiple receipts, those would be translated at a land-based station that all of these sonar buoys or hydrophones were connected to through underwater cabling. And then that information would be sent on to the fleet to act on it. Um, so later on, uh, towards the 19, later 1950s, it was decided that it was very important to start laying out uh, a similar SOSIS net across what was called the GI-UK gap or Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, which is seen here in uh, cold waters. 
they started laying that out and it allowed since the Soviet Union was operating uh, through these uh, interior lines um, they had to try to break out past this line the GI UK gap um, to get out into the North Atlantic to get out and actually attack their enemies so if we have this passive barrier it's not actually the barrier itself is not stopping the submarines but it's relaying their exact position back to our fleet and allowing our fleet to intercept them later still an additional group of sonar buoys and hydrophones was laid uh, between Norway and uh, northern islands that are claimed by Norway and those are also seen here um, in the uh, in cold waters so getting back a little bit to the action we're going to start to see us intercepting this uh, Spetsnaz team and when they're having an encounter with Sosis it's not going to go so well for them uh, and Sosis is going to prove its value protecting NATO shores so here we are in the icy waters off of Norway, back in our Los Angeles class attack submarine, the USS Olympia. And we already have a contact bearing 83 degrees, contact Sierra 1, uh, estimated range 20.2 thousand yards. We're going to speed it up a little Sierra here, one. Uh, but I don't think Sierra. that contact is that far away. Now we've lost him, um, but originally when we were getting him, we got intelligence that the Spetsnaz team was going to be infiltrated by a diesel electric submarine. Um, and these are notoriously much more quiet than their nuclear-powered counterparts. Running uh, on a battery system underwater here. is a very uh, quiet way to operate feet. a submarine. So we're going to try to bottom the boat out here uh, to get a bit of a listen out and see what's out here in the water. We're going to be creeping along, but when he's running on batteries, it's pretty difficult to hear anything. And the ambient noise level is up at 91 decibels. Um, gonna hit the torpedo for active search as soon as it goes out of the tubes. Don't want him to be able to get away. Now when the torpedo is uh, on active search, it's actually gonna zero, be able to... Well, we just, bearing, we've got zero, that contact nine, back. Three. Um, got a bearing, gonna fire a snapshot off here, have the go active at about 2,000 yards. Trying to refine this contact up. Instead of taking that snapshot, I've got a 44% shooting solution, but now he was much closer, 3,000 yards in closing. Does he have me? He hasn't gone active, and he's still going along at 8 knots, so I hold off on the snapshot. And as I was mentioning, when the torpedo is in active search and not just using its passive seeker head, it's going to be much more likely to be able to break through any countermeasures that he deploys at me. Still trying to run down exactly what type of contact he is. Ranges at estimated 2.3 thousand yards. 48% firing solution on Con him. Sonar. But he's Sierra nice and ahead of me. As I'm going to say submarine. it's a whiskey. That's a very early Soviet submarine. Um, almost an immediate post-World War II design. But no wonder he is so quiet. The game lists him as being semi-noisy. Uh, but when these are running underwater with their batteries on, they are pretty difficult to hear. So I'm going to work up again a shooting solution on this guy. I'm going to see if he gets a little bit better of a target track. I want to know which way he's going. Okay, he's closing straight in at me. All stop. Helm, I. All stop. We're going to go nice and quiet here. I don't want him picking me up. He's maybe now my hesitation. Oh. Firing two, one. Boom, off goes the torpedo. Now I switched it back to passive because he's so close. Yep, he's gone active. He's detected me. Gonna throw it all ahead flank. Torpedo maneuver and avoidance. I know we're cavitating. That's fine. That torpedo is already tracking on him. Active sonars coming in at us. He is close aboard. Oh, man, he was right there. He was less than a thousand yards away in that immediate post-war whiskey submarine. See, I had mentioned how quiet these get. Look how close he got to me. And I still only had, was it a 50, maybe 60% shooting solution on him? Well, he's going down to the bottom with that Spetsnaz team that he had on board. And that's just where we need him to be. Yep, confirmed. Whiskey sunk. We've done a good job getting rid of those Spetsnaz commandos. And, yeah, more red submarines headed to the bottom and keeping our allied military installations safe.
Now they're going to try to head out with another diesel electric wolf, wolf pack. Uh, and this wolf pack is exactly what the GU, uh, GI UK GAP SOSIS net was expressly designed to prevent. Uh, so we're going to head over here. Now it looks like they were going to try to get out into the North Sea based off of our briefing. So of course they're going to have to go past the line of SOSIS that runs from um, Andoya, Norway, all the way up to Spitsbergen, another Norwegian territory. So I can just hang out on the other side of the SOSIS line. We've got our maritime patrol craft going overhead. Now, I don't know what this is. It's a surface contact, might have submarines with it. Um, that's what that icon will indicate. If it is both a uh, surface and submarine mixed group, it will still show up as that Big submarine contact or surface ship contact. Now, if it's just submarines, it'll appear as submarines uh, only on the, or the strategic map. So we've already got a contact bearing 143. I'm going to throw a Harpoon anti-ship missile nine, into the one, tubes here zero, in case two. we have ships out there that don't have strong sea whiz um, a, a close-in weapon system to shoot down escort. our missiles. But coming up a little bit. Ooh, that was a strong active sonar Come contact. On, sonar. Sierra, They're definitely two, putting it out there. Escort. We're going to classify up these two, and that's a Kara class anti-submarine cruiser. I wonder if we can take him out. Boom. Pop that off. We're going to crank up the speed. We're going to full flank torpedo avoidance. He'll know exactly where we are just off of the basis of that missile launcher. Oh, and there's his anti-submarine helicopter that our missile just flashed by. He is close aboard. We're going to go full down on the planes, dive on the ballast, and there's that anti-submarine warfare helicopter. The absolute worst nightmare of any so, uh, submarine captain. Our harpoon's headed in. Not likely fooled by his chaff. But he's not gone down. Was that a hit? Yeah, it was a hit, and he's firing back. That is a, uh, uh, a ship-launched rocket-powered torpedo that will fire out at us towards where we launch. He's getting those target coordinates from his submarine. So I'm trying to change the datum. I'm dropping down. We're now at over 800 feet. He's hit us with active sonar. That listening sub... Uh, you're calling it a submarine. It is a helicopter. That listening helicopter is still up there. He's going to be giving us information. Our information back to that Kara and probably the cannon as well. So I'm going to shoot out a Moss here. I usually like to travel with one Moss in the tubes and three torpedoes or other weapons. That Moss is going to go out and it's a submarine simulator, as those of you that play Cold Waters know. Um, it will give back a uh, sonar return of basically my submarine. And there's a torpedo in the water. It's coming down. He's yeah. He had a pretty good launch because of the triangulation that he was getting off of that anti-submarine helicopter. Now the enemy torpedo is going for my moss. I'm going to see, should I crack off a torpedo back up the way that that cannon is, or that Kara class? Con, yep, we've got a bearing on him. Snap feet. the torpedo uh, off. We're going to lose the water. that... Uh, the water. Uh, uh, that torpedo is locked onto me. Shit, here it comes. It was originally uh, onto the moss, but it must have flashed Head, past blank. the moss. Helm. It is now tracking on me. Passing. So we're going to go to full feet. speed, torpedo avoidance, Con, pop Sonar, a noisemaker into the water, One. and we've Last got our bearing. torpedo One, four, headed back eight. down the Con, track the towards that Kara class um, anti-submarine cruiser. Now you'll Passing. notice One I'm not going feet. deeper, even though there's no um, floor here. I'm actually going up as high as I can after we're dodging around this torpedo. Cranked in at the engine. We are headed back Passing up. I'm quiet as I'm trying to loop up. I'm originally hoping that this torpedo is going to snap around Con, and sonar, reacquire on my moss, which is further zero, away. One, bearing, but I think one, the moss four. is now outside Passing of the range feet. of that torpedo seeker head. Instead, it's going in at the noisemaker. It loops in past the noisemaker. And it's going to go back into that search pattern, that turning search pattern. Passing but I've now come feet. up about 100 feet from where I was, and I'm up above this torpedo. And since I'm quiet, I am outside Passing of the detection feet. seeker cone of this torpedo. So it's just going to spin around down there. 
As I come back up all to about 550 all feet, I'm several hundred feet up above this torpedo Nine now. Sonar. Noise and boom, there goes the torpedo. Didn't hit anything, detonated in the water. And our torpedo that we snapped off down the bearing of that Kara has netted us some positive results. Our moss is still cooking away over there in the water, making some noise. But I don't think that that's fooling Ahead, anyone anymore. Con, torpedo room, tube uh, two ready. Get another torpedo back into the tubes. Like to have a full weapons load. Now I'm wondering where that I think it was a cannon class destroyer is. He's mm, last bearing had him out there a ways. And that aircraft is still Ahead, nearby, so I can't third. get out of Hell here. I. So I'm quiet up. Let's see if we can get another bearing on that cannon. Anti-submarine helicopter is still up there, and he's got two torpedoes that he could be throwing at me. Yeah, that cannon is getting on, pretty so close. Now it's stopping me Sierra, from two, going. Bearing, oh, zero, there he nine, is. Four. He got mighty close. He's now, well, is he out? Wow. Our, our sonar contact is refining itself and putting him much farther out than he was. Just doubled that distance. Um, so that's why you need to be careful when you're snapshotting off weapons and then having them arm either too soon or too late based off of these 30 and 20 percent shooting solutions so we've got a pretty good bearing on the cannon range is questionable um, but it is definitely coming in so we're gonna have the torpedo go active pretty early out it goes we're gonna have it stick to passive because there might just be enough noise in the water and I'm gonna manually make this torpedo go active to acquire a target immediately so it's gonna start climbing up to the surface because obviously it's a surface contact. We don't need it scuttling around down here at 500 feet. It's going to come up to the surface. And we're going to see exactly what it's going to pick up. Yep, that cannon's gone active with his sonar. He's probably pinging at me. And he might even have a decent contact on me. But he doesn't have any weapons that are capable of engaging me at this distance. The only thing I have to kind of be worried about is that anti-submarine helicopter up there but we've snapped off the wire since we're turning but that's fine that torpedo is headed off down the track towards that cannon I am not really worried about it but we're gonna slap a fresh torpedo in the tubes as I have a habit of doing yeah it makes you ever so slightly noisy but I don't really think um, it, it's worth uh, the trade-off of, of having a completely empty weapons bay when you might need to start shooting off more torpedoes. Con, the last thing you room, want is two, to need two, ready. to fire something and then have a completely open bay um, and have to take a minute or two to get another torpedo or another weapon into the tubes uh, when you're trying to fiercely maneuver against either a surface vessel um, or a close-in submarine. Because like I mentioned, this could be... Um, there could be submarines here. We're not entirely sure that it was just this Kara um, and the cannon. Well, our torpedo has changed bearing, so that means it is locked onto something. That cannon is cranking out at 24 knots. He is at full speed torpedo avoidance. But it is unlikely he is going to be able to break away. Um, these modern homing torpedoes are very unlikely to miss, uh, especially when they're going after a surface contact. A uh, submarine can move in three directions, obviously, or three dimensions, um, but this... Oof, this uh, surface ship does not stand much of a chance coming up against us. So it's going to track in on him, and we're going to see what uh, what luck this cannon crew is going to have. Now, these vessels were actually not um, really major surface vessels. The cannon class was designed um, mostly by the shipyards that had also been tasked with building uh, merchant traffic and heavy trawlers and the support vessels for the Red Fleet. Um, these were not um, the kind of capital ships like that Kara class that we put on the bottom. I wouldn't call the Kara uh, like a heavy surface flagship or anything, but it is not insubstantial. Well, our torpedo has a great bearing on the cannon. Cannon is breaking in, but yeah, it is only a matter of time now. If I was on that ship, I'd be jumping for the rails, knocking off those life uh, Sierra, boats. Two. Boom! Bearing, zero, now these torpedoes... Um, were actually designed when they were hitting a surface contact to go under the keel. Yep, got the Kara, got the cannon, good to go. Um, but these torpedoes were designed to actually go uh, dip under the keel of the vessel instead of striking it right on the side. Um, go underneath the keel, explode, create a knuckle of water, 
um, and actually break the back of the ship and ideally split it in half. Um, obviously, it's much more difficult for a crew to try to put their ship back together when it's broken into two pieces right down the middle um, than it is to patch a hole or to seal off bulkheads around a, a rupture in the side of the ship. But that cannon didn't stand much of a chance. Uh, there are no contacts, and we're still going to be going out against this diesel electric wolf pack. So mm, they're breaking off. They're staying along the Sosis line. I'm wondering where this wolf pack is. Is that it? Coming off of Norway? Probably. I'm going to sit here and let him come out for the intercept. Go to slightly deeper water. We're going to try to see what this is. Contact bearing Sierra 1. Bearing 66 degrees. Our depth is 50 feet. Uh, we are nice and quiet, sitting right up by the surface. There's no thermal layer, no surface duct. Uh, and it seems to be a nice day outside. But it's not going to be a nice day here underneath the waves in cold waters. So we've got all of our bearings, all of our contact information. Got to make sure our tubes are loaded the right way. Quiet. All right, man, your battle station. It's going to rig for ultra quiet. We're going to start dropping down. Now, the floor here is all the way down at 800 feet, which is why I had ducked out a little bit farther when I was uh, getting ready for this intercept. I didn't want to intercept these guys in water that was maybe three or 400 feet deep. That doesn't give me a lot of maneuver room, especially when I'm outnumbered and there might be enemy weapons in the water coming Passing back towards me. Feet. So I'm going to start to try to classify what we've got here uh, uh, as sonar. a surface contact, Sierra, Sierra one, 1. Is classified is as a submerged a tango? submarine. And we're going to go with Tango for now, um, and then Con, that's sonar, probably Sierra a Juliet. Would not entirely surprise me um, that you're going to see a Juliet class uh, operating in a strike group like this. Now, the Juliet um, is a diesel electric powered uh, submarine. Feet. Uh, just like the other ones that we've been encountering so far. So, like I said, it can be very, very quiet. Uh, but it launches cruise missiles. Passing uh, it was preceded feet. by the Echo class of submarines um, that feet. could come up to the surface and Passing launch their cruise missiles. Feet. Uh, but the Juliets Passing were capable of feet. either launching cruise missiles or medium-range missiles uh, with a nuclear strike payload, or they could launch um, anti-ship missiles, which is most likely what they're loaded for, for the kind of mission they'd be going All out done to hit oh, uh, our uh, NATO supply ships coming across. So let's see, we've got contacts on that Tango, and we're getting a better contact down on that Juliet. But the Juliet's farther away and poses less of a threat to me than it does than the Tango, which is closer aboard. Um, so as I was mentioning, the Juliet was capable uh, not only of carrying uh, torpedoes, but it was also capable of carrying uh, four SSN or SSN-12, sorry, SSN-3s, or SSN-12s, uh, which were variations of uh, strike missiles that would either be hitting land targets or could hit ships. So these guys are going to be trying to obviously break out and go after the North Atlantic convoys. That Tango would be escorting the strike package, which is the Juliet. That Tango is much more dangerous, but I've got a much better bearing on the Juliet. I've got it down. It's confirmed, but he's going to the s surface? Is he, tr is he trying to launch his weapons? I don't know why this Juliet is going up to the surface. Maybe I've struck them just when his batteries need to recharge. We've got a perfect bearing on him. We could we could hit him at Con, any time. Make that torpedo room, go active. Tube three. Launch it away Con, so it gets a little bit of legs room, out from us. Tube, tube. Now we're going to snap another weapon away down the bearing of that ah, tango. Sonar. He's yeah, gone active on his sonar. The Tango is cavitating. I don't know his exact range. Yeah, he was closer than I thought now that his engine's firmed up. So good thing I made that torpedo go active when I did. The seeker head on that torpedo is oscillating. It's, it's having ahead. some trouble One locking third. on, but Hell it's man. tracking on him. That Juliet... Is that Juliet still surfaced? Yeah, that Juliet is still sitting up on the surface. Uh, We've got... Our weapon's got a firm zero, contact eight, on this Tango. Does a go-around maneuver as he's breaking hard to the left dumps a noisemaker, trying to confuse it, but our torpedo is going to snap back around, reacquires him with the active seeker head. That's the end for this tango. He's trying to pour on the speed, but there is no way he's outrunning a modern anti-submarine torpedo. That's the end of the tango. Now the threat to me is substantially reduced, but the threat to our surface ship still remains. We've got to hit this Juliet. 
which if he's still up on the surface, he might not even know that his compatriot just got uh, completely destroyed. So we're going to snap this torpedo ah, so up, Sierra make it go active, and head to the surface to get a lock on this Juliet. Yep, we've got a lock actively homing in on him. Now the Juliet's gone active as well. He knows he's being attacked. But up here on the surface, there's there is no chance of him getting Ahead, away. Blank. He's slow oh, on the uh, surface, maxed out uh, apparently so at 14 knots. One, um, one, these six. these boats are capable of diving pretty deep. Uh, six, test depth on these boats was 775 feet. Um, so he would have had room to maneuver down there um, with a design depth of hypothetically 1,200 feet. Uh, but up here on the surface, he's got no chance. He's nice and slow. Passing Boom. 400 feet. There goes the Juliet. And that ends the threat, I think. Yep, that's the end of the threat to our uh, surface combatants and our merchant ships bringing supplies over from the U.S. Once again, SOSIS has done its job in conjunction with the uh, submarine fleet. And we've kept our convoys protected. We've got another group of Spetsnaz coming down, but that'll have to wait till next time. Uh, thank you very much for all tuning in. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed the video. Please feel free to give us a like and a subscribe if you enjoy this content. I'm trying to grow the channel out a little bit. Um, and you'll get more Cold Waters, Worlds of Warships, World of Tanks, uh, and maybe some other games coming your way soon. Thanks everyone uh, for your tuning in. I'm your captain, the Ocular Duck, and have a great day.